A great earthquake strikes an unnamed prefecture in rural Japan. This by itself isn't so unusual. Japan sits directly on top of the Ring of Fire, a region of major tectonic activity circling the Pacific Ocean. Some 90% of the world's earthquakes occur along the Ring of Fire, and severe quakes and volcanic activity have been common from ancient Japanese history through to the present day. In Shinto mythology, a giant catfish demon named Namazu lives in the mud beneath Japan, and he's restrained under a huge boulder by the god Kishima. But whenever Kishima drops his guard or stops paying attention, Namazu breaks free and thrashes the ground, causing earthquakes and tremors. Today, this catfish is the symbol of earthquake emergency response teams in Japan. As one of the world's most seismically active countries, earthquakes have always been a part of life in Japan. And as the world witnessed with the Fukushima incident of 2011, they can strike quickly and without warning, swallowing up human life and wreaking havoc in the blink of an eye. So that earthquake in rural Japan certainly was not of the ordinary, no. What's remarkable about this particular quake is what happened afterwards. The Amigara Fault split wide open and emerged from the ground. And seemingly carved into the face of this newly exposed fault line are thousands of human-shaped holes that run deep into the mountain. Dark and bottomless silhouettes that almost appear to be rising towards heaven in a pantomime of the rapture, hinting at a sinister, otherworldly origin. A fissure in the fabric of reality has opened. What is waiting on the inside? It is the eldritch horror of Chunji Ito. Enigma of Amigara Fault is a short comic by Junji Ito included in the compilation of his horror serial Gyo. It is considered by many to be one of Ito's finest and most memorable works, and for good reason. Amigara Fault is a prime example of his ability to take mundane and everyday events and spin them into macabre and unforgettable tales. After seeing reports of the earthquake on television, a young man named Owaki goes on a trek out into the countryside to see this phenomenon with his own eyes. He can't quite put a finger on it, but he feels a strange compulsion, an irresistible pull beckoning him towards the fault. On his way, he meets a woman named Yoshida. Hi! Hello over there! I'm Owaki. What's your name? I'm Yoshida. Like our protagonist, she too saw the report on TV and felt that same overwhelming urge to visit Amigara Fault. As they arrive, they discover many others just like them who felt that same irrational compulsion to seek out the ominous crevice. After probing some of the mysterious holes, a team of researchers comes to the conclusion that they must have been dug out thousands of years ago, but many in the gathering crowd seem to think otherwise. The onlookers traveled here because, among the uncountable amount of silhouettes they witnessed on TV, they saw, or felt, that one of these holes belonged to them. I saw it on TV. I know I saw it. One of these holes. But now that I'm here, there are so many holes, I have no idea where it is. So, what's so special about this hole? It was identical. No, it went beyond that. That hole was my silhouette. One man finds his right away. In front of the gathered onlookers, he frantically starts undressing and then steps right into the hole. Within an instant, he slides deep into the side of the mountain and is never seen again. The researchers probe 30 meters into the orifice, but can't find any traces of the man. 
The next morning, Yoshida finally discovers her hole, and an unspoken fear manifests on her face. Coming or a fault will consume them all, and each and every one is completely powerless to resist it. Amigara Falls' themes are rooted in a psychological term known as compulsion, the obsessive desire to do or repeat a certain action, even though that action may be unhealthy, irrational, or have sometimes severe negative consequences. This is, for instance, the case in the condition known as OCD, Obsessive Compulsive Disorder. Compulsion manifests as repetitive behaviors or thoughts that you're virtually unable to control, like having to lock doors multiple times or washing your hands repeatedly, and so on. You may be aware in your rational mind that this behavior doesn't make sense, but these rituals and actions nevertheless release an intense internal psychological pressure. Compulsion also has a far more common and recognizable face, and that is addiction. We can become dependent on all kinds of things. Everything from processed sugar and caffeine to hard drugs like cocaine, heroin, meth, and so on. Pleasure-inducing behaviors like sex, gambling, and pornography can become equally psychologically and also physically addicting, and they can be every bit as treacherous and powerful. The more we give in to our addictions, the more we become dependent on the chemical reaction they create in our brains. At first, satisfying these cravings releases large amounts of serotonin and dopamine in our brains, neurotransmitting chemicals that induce feelings of pleasure. But as we consume more, there are diminishing returns. Over time, the mesolimbic pathway, also known as the reward pathway of our brains, transmits less and less of these happiness chemicals we need, which makes us gradually crave more and more of the addictive substance to compensate for it. Eventually, this cycle of anticipation, pleasure and release becomes an irrational, compulsive force, one that eventually consumes the addict's life. But what if these forces aren't just down to chemical reactions in the brain? What if they're part of an ancient, ongoing struggle that plays out in every single person? For the Austrian neurologist Sigmund Freud, this wasn't such a strange notion. Freud believed compulsion and addiction to be small parts of an epic clash between the forces of life and death. In his 1920 essay, Beyond the Pleasure Principle, Freud theorizes that all human beings have conflicting internal desires to both live and die, and that these instincts have been in constant struggle with each other for all of human existence. He calls our life-giving instincts the Lebenstrieb. This is our love for friends and family, our desire to form social bonds and communities, our creativity, and most importantly for Freud, our urge to have sex and procreate. In opposition to this stands the Todestrieb, our instincts for aggression and anger, which are ultimately the desire to return life to its primordial and inorganic state. In Freud's view, human existence is a constant struggle between these opposing dualities, light and dark, eros and thanatos, life instinct and death drive. As we've said, Freud's death drive manifests in forms like aggression, selfishness, antisocial behavior and murder. However, some of us instead turn our death drive against ourselves. In modern psychology, depression is sometimes described as anger turned inward. Many people who struggle with depression and suicidal thoughts experience an inner voice that argues it is better to end one's life rather than to continue to struggle and suffer. It is an irrational but persistent voice that makes no explanations for itself but demands to be satisfied. So in the same way the death drive compels us to destroy others, it can also urge us to destroy ourselves. Amigara Fault is ultimately an allegory for Japan's highly regimented and isolated society. 
It is a homogenous and in many ways highly conformist nation with a culture that places a high importance on conservative values like order and tradition. A popular Japanese proverb says, the stake that sticks up gets hammered down. And there is a dark side to this culture of conformity. Japan has one of the highest suicide rates in the world. In any highly regimented and hyper-competitive culture, free thinkers and individuals must contort and twist themselves to fit into the place assigned to them by society. Those who can't fit in might withdraw completely from society, isolating themselves and never leaving their home. You must find your hole, even if it kills you. In the final part, we witness the climax of this struggle between life instinct and death drive, as Yoshida, terrified of the ominous calling from the vault, seeks shelter in Iwaki's tent, she reveals exactly why she is so afraid. I've always been alone, ever since I was a child. My parents didn't care about me, neither did my friends. Don't worry, I'm here with you. They find comfort in each other's arms and seem to escape their death drive, their desire to enter the fault, by following their life instinct. They embrace, kiss, and spend the night together. But their love is not meant to last. In the dead of night, Owaki starts from his sleep after a nightmare and finds that Yoshida is gone. In dreadful anticipation, he hastes back to the fault and finds his worst fears confirmed. Yoshida has entered her hole. Hey! Yoshida! Come, Come back! back! Damn! Why? Why do you do it? Do it! Do it! Do it! Do it! Why? <laughs> Alone once again, Iwaki feels desperate and world weary. And in this final instant, as if fate itself reaches its hand out, his flashlight slips from his hand, drops to the ground, and it points straight at one of the holes. This is... This is my hole! With nothing left to cling to in this life, he enters an almost stoic state of acceptance. Intuitively and methodically, he gets rid of his clothes and recedes to his most primal self. His Thanatos has taken over completely, and so he enters his hole to slide into nothingness. Several months later, a team of geologists locates the backside, the place where the holes in the fault empty out, kilometers away from the origin. But something isn't right. These holes don't look anything like the silhouettes on the other side. They look like freakish distortions of their original shapes. And as they peer inside, they discover the grisly truth. Those who entered the fault on the other side have been crushed and mangled into twisted perversions of their former selves by the passage, their shapes tangled, crooked, contorted into demonic abominations that are about to be unleashed. Just as the death drive in each one of us is always out to return life to its primal origins, so too are the victims of Amigara Fault compelled to return to a state of living death. Here, at the strange fissure between realities, the eternal dance between Eros and Thanatos comes full circle once again. Despite increased federal safety measures, more people have been reported missing in the fog line caused by the recent earthquake in the prefecture. Due to hundreds of requests of relatives, I will now read the list of names that have been officially confirmed to have been disappeared into their human-shaped holes. James Lynch, Simon Anderson, Caroline Mills, Kevin Davis, Ronnie Minot, Thiago Pereira dos Santos Silva, Lucas Porter, Chase Ladner, Canton Prodome, Michelle Stoliker, Marissa Martinez, Christopher Collish, 
Jacob Woodward, Sebastian Garcia, Wojciech Bukowski, Yasin Inat, Travis Deng, Thwagam, Dark Blue One, Evan Tekro, Pascal Failing, Milan Vujnovic, Andrei Kriakushin, Luke Johnson, Dmitry Pirak, Danny Sandel, Carlos Vega, Adel Alfalasi, and Nicholas Stevenson. If you are familiar with one of those persons or one of the names shown at the bottom, please direct any information that could help to your local authorities. This was UCC at Amigara Falls, and we'll keep you updated on further events live on Rockstars.